what is the probability of a complement? And we had uh, this formula here. The probability of E complement is one minus the probability of E. And uh, this is very useful in a lot of um, settings because we want to we want to calculate the probability of E complement, and that's a real hard probability. But on the other hand, the probability of E might be an easy probability. So if this is an easy probability to calculate, we could just take one minus that number, and it would give us the probability of this more complicated one. And one of the um, applications of this is this at least once probability. And it usually takes place in a scenario where the possible outcomes are zero, one, two, three, four, five, up to some larger number. And at least one means one or more. So the only probability that's not included in all of those is the none probability. So here's how they write it. The probability of an event happening at least once, and you'll see that a lot, is one minus the probability that it does not happen. So I'd like to go through an example to, to show you where that applies and where it doesn't. So problem number 26 is one such problem. Um, here's the application of that, that property, but so I'll show it to you once we, we calculate it. Okay, um, the probability that a region is prone to flooding, a region prone to flooding, like that, old, that area over there in uh, Midland County that flooded, uh, they flood every 10 years or so. Uh, usually it's not because of the dam breaks, but it just floods when there's a lot of, of water. And in a single year is one tenth. And so if the probability of flooding is, is one tenth, then we can ask lots of questions. Um, what is the probability of a flood two years in a row? Now, what we're assuming here is that whether it will flood in a year or not is independent about in, of what it has done in the past. So every year is independent. Every year, the probability of a flood is still one tenth. Even if there was a flood the last three years, the probability, it's like flipping a coin. The probability of flipping a coin is one half. Well, if you flip it two times, every single time, the probability of getting ahead is one half. Even if you flip 12 heads in a row, the probability of getting ahead on that 13th toss is still, is still one half. So results of past experiments does not, do not influence what would happen on the next trial. And that's what we're talking about here, only we're talking about flooding instead of flipping coins. So what's the probability uh, of a flood two years in a row? Well, you can think of it as a kind of a Venn diagram. Flood, uh, excuse me, a tree diagram. Uh, no flood. And uh, for this tree diagram, if this was the first year, the probability of a flood is one-tenth. So that means the probability that we wouldn't get a flood in that year would be nine-tenths, one minus one-tenth. So it's always a 10% chance that there's going to be a flood and a 90% chance that things are not going to flood. Okay, so now let's look at the second year. Flood or no flood? You know, probably just abbreviate these. And we'll stop here. Ten, nine tenths. So every single year, the probability is ten, regardless of what happened, one tenth, regardless of what happened in the previous year. So if we didn't flood in one year, the probability of flooding in the next year would still be one tenth. If it didn't flood, the probability that it wouldn't flood the next year is still nine tenths. Okay. So I'm going to try to do all of our problems today with these tree diagrams, just so you can get a pretty good sense of, of how it applies in a lot of different contexts. All right, so what is the probability of a flood two years in a row? So flood the first year and flood the second year. So what we would do to calculate this probability, uh, flood and flood, flood in the first year and flood in the second year, is use that multiplication rule. And so we just multiply the probabilities along the path, flood and flood, one tenth times one tenth, and that's one over a hundred. So that's a, you know, one percent chance that there would be a flooding two years in a row. Very unlikely to happen. All right, what is the probability of flooding three consecutive years? All right, now it's going to get old trying to draw these uh, tree diagrams that um, branch out. So if we had first, second, third, 
flood, no flood, flood, no flood, flood, no flood, and so on. And then we branch it out for the third year, we would still have to have flood and no flood for each one of these. Generally, what we do for uh, mathematics is, is we'll kind of do the problem by brute force. And after a while, we'll observe a pattern. And when, instead of like writing out another, you know, what if someone asks us, you know, what is, what's the likelihood that it would flood in say 10 years in a row, then we would have one, two, three, and we'd have to go out four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10. And this tree just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So we try to look for a pattern after a while. All right, probability of getting a flood is one-tenth, always. One-tenth, one-tenth. The probability of not getting a flood would be nine-tenths, always. Anytime that the events are independent, the probabilities will be the same, they will not change. Okay, so the probability of flood and flood and flood. So these tree diagrams can go out further. But the way that we would calculate this one is to multiply all the probabilities along the branches, three different branches. So this one would be one-tenth times one-tenth times one-tenth. Three different years. In mathematics, we would write that one-tenth to the third power. All right, it does simplify to one over a thousand, which is 0.1% or 0 0.001. All right, focus in here and focus in here. Two years, one tenth to the second power. Three years, one tenth to the third power. See the pattern? There it is. Okay, here comes the question. Now, I'm going to run out of paper if I want to do. 10 years, right? But using the pattern that you observe here, what do you think the probability of no flooding for 10 years in a row would be? Anybody want to try, uh, uh, try it? You can write it in exponent language if you want or exponent terms. Go ahead and put your answer in the chat if you know it. Okay, I'm not seeing any answers, so um, I am seeing answers. Um, close, okay, so Lindsay and uh, Anna, responded nine tenths to the tenth. Um, so that would be what would the probability that there would be no floods for 10 consecutive years. This was the probability of a flood, right? And they said, what's the probability of no floods? So they switched it up on you, right? So no floods would be nine tenths to the tenth power. That word right there, no, is what changed this one. What's the probability of flooding? What's the probability of no flooding? So I didn't do it, but if you did, you would have no flooding in the first, no flooding in the second, no flooding in the third, and all of these probabilities are nine tenths. So no flooding for 10 years would be nine tenths. And so you are correct for those of you and those of you that answered one tenth to the tenth, you were thinking, what's the probability that there would be a flood in um, in all of those in all of those years? Very unlikely. Okay. Now the next one is what is the probability of flooding at least once? So the probability of at least one flood in ten years equals at least once, at least once in 10 years, is one minus the probability of no floods in 10 years. And the probability of no floods, no floods for 10 years is what we calculated in part C. So we can calculate this one not so bad, but if you wanted to try to calculate in some other way, use uh, the probability that at least one flood, at least one flood means there was one flood in 10 years, or there was two floods in 10 years, or there was three floods in 10 years, and you'd have to calculate a different probability for each one of those. It's much more difficult than doing it the way we're going to do it here, because this one right here is the answer 
2c. And so we take 1 minus the 9 tenths to the 10th power. All right, so 0.9 to the 10th power is 0.3. I'm going to just round these to um, three decimal places. And then 1 minus that is 0.6. Five, one. All right, so we'll we'll summarize this. Um, probabilities are nice because we can change them to percentages, and then we can interpret the probabilities from there. And so, if you were if you were thinking about moving to an area that was prone to flood, and you ask, well, you know, what is the likelihood that that we're not going to get a flood in ten years? And it would be this. Well, if you plan to live there for 10 years, what's the likelihood that there'd be at least one flood during the, the years that you live in this place, in this flood zone? And when you calculate it, it's this here. So there's almost a two-thirds chance, 66.6, two-thirds. There's almost a two-thirds chance that you would experience at least one flood among the 10 years that you lived in that house and that, that was in the flood uh, plain. Okay, so this is a complement rule in independence. Uh, it also allowed us to do a problem where we, we worked on tree diagrams. I introduced the conditional probability formula last time, so I'm not going to go through that much, but we will work on several problems. Did I tell you that probability is the hardest section in the entire course? It is. The hardest, by far. I think a lot of that has to do with students don't have a whole lot of um, experiences, that, uh, experiences with probability as they're going through school. So if this is making sense to you, uh, that's great. If it's not, well, just keep plugging along. Eventually you'll make some sense of it. It's difficult though. All right, um, box of chocolates. There are 30 chocolates in a box and they all look the same. They're identically shaped. They might be little cubes or little gumdrops or something like that. Five are filled with coconut. 10 are filled with caramel. That's spelled caramel and 15 are solid chocolate. And if you add those three numbers together, you get the box of chocolate, 30 in the box. All right, now here's a, a great example of, a, um, of two events that are not uh, independent because is, uh, when you select chocolates, presumably you're going to eat them. And so when you select your first chocolate, you can't eat your chocolate and have it too. And eat, have your cake and eat it too. I mean, because if you eat it, then you don't have it. So when you choose that first chocolate, you can't put it back into the box and then randomly select another chocolate. Why would one do this? To put their germs on one of the pieces of chocolate? No, you take one out and you eat it and then you grab another one. So the second time that you're choosing from the box, there are no longer 30 chocolates or how many? Okay, good, 29. 29 chocolates left. So keep that in mind as we select our two chocolates. Whenever you're doing a problem where you're doing things in sequence, choose one chocolate, even if it's the same thing, and then you choose another chocolate. You're doing two things. A tree diagram is, is a great little tool to have. All right. So every probability has its own tree diagram. So let's try to model this one. And they want caramels caramel filled, and we only have 10 of those. All right, so we're gonna use this information. The, the first set of probabilities deal with the, the first chocolate, and the second set of probabilities deal with selecting the second chocolate, and the probabilities will be different in each case. All right, let's think of a nice fresh box of 30 chocolates. Our event here are two caramel filled chocolates, so our goal is caramel or something else or something else could be coconut or the solid chocolate. But this particular event focuses on selecting chocolates, two in a row. So um, caramel filled chocolates. So I'm gonna say caramel and not. Now you could even do a, a, a more grandiose tree diagram where you had coconuts, one branch, caramels, the next branch, and then solid chocolates, the third branch. You could do that here because you have three different kinds. But for this particular event, they're only interested in selecting caramels, caramel filled. All right, so since we're going to select two, we need to write this twice. Caramel, caramel, not caramel. Caramel, 
not caramel. And we repeat the caramel not caramel twice over here because we want all six of these probabilities to be labeled. And we can select a caramel as our second caramel, as our second chocolate, or a non-caramel after first having selected a caramel in the first one. Or we could select a non-caramel as our first chocolate. There would still be caramels and non-caramels to choose from. So we want to make sure that our tree diagram has all the possible outcomes. All right, our goal uh, is to write probabilities. You can write the fraction form, which makes sense for this problem, or decimal version here and here. Now, these are the only two outcomes that we've established. You're either going to choose a caramel or you're not. So these two probabilities have to add up to one. A probability in its complement adds up to one. All right, let's put probabilities along the branch. All right, so first chocolate. We have 30 chocolates in the box. It's a fresh, it's a fresh box of chocolates. What's the probability of selecting caramels if there are 10 caramels in the box? Okay, very good. There are 10 caramels out of the 30. So the likelihood that we would select a caramel on that first selection is 10 out of 30. What about non-caramels out of that first box? What would probability would we put here? Okay, 20 out of 30. Because there are five coconuts and there are 15 solids. Together that makes up 20. And you'll notice that 10 thirtieths plus 20 thirtieths add up to 30 thirtieths, which is one. So at every branching, the two probabilities will add up to one. All right, now the next grouping is more difficult because if we're going up this branch, then that means that the first caramel that we, or the first chocolate that we selected was a caramel. So if the first chocolate that we selected was a caramel, then there's one fewer caramel in the box. So instead of 10 caramels, there's going to be nine. And there's going to be one fewer chocolate to select from because we've just taken one of those caramels and eaten it. So there's only 29 left. So imagine that you have a box of 29 chocolates with one of the caramels removed. Now you're going to grab your second piece. Because in this experiment, we're selecting two. So based on what's left in the box, what's the probability of getting a caramel? Good. Nine caramels out of 29. And what's the probability of getting something other than a caramel on that second draw? How many non-caramels do we have? If the first one that we selected was a caramel, we still have five coconuts, but we only have nine caramels. We still have 15 solid chocolates. Yes, we still have 20 non-caramels, but we're selecting from 29. All right, now to put the probabilities down here, we can't just grab these and put them down here. In fact, if we grab these and put them down here, the problem would be wrong. Why is it wrong? So that's wrong because when we went up this branch, we assumed the first chocolate that we selected was a caramel. Now we're going to go back and say, well, what if that first caramel or that first chocolate was a, was a non-caramel? What if it was a coconut or a solid chocolate? We still have the 10 caramels in the box but we have one non-caramel that we've taken out of the box, so there's only 29 caramels left. Okay, what's the probability of getting a caramel on the next draw, on the second draw, if the first candy that we had was a non-caramel chocolate? What probability goes here? Okay, good. There's still car 10 caramels left, but only 29 to select from. And what goes down here? You can use the idea that the sum of these two probabilities have to add up to one. Yeah, there are no longer 20 non-caramels. There are only 19 because we ate one on the first round. Okay, so there it is. Now, the way we calculate a probability when we have two events in sequence is we circle the event that we're interested in, flood and flood, and then we multiply the two probabilities that appear on the branches. So for this one here, um, it says, what is the problem? Find the probability of selecting two caramels in a row. So that's the probability of caramel and caramel. And here is the outcome we're after, right there. So the answer to this is 10 thirtieths times 9 29ths. And uh, generally, we would um, simplify that as a fraction. 
and remember you've got this math function that you can that you can use. 10 thirtieths times 9 29 convert to a fraction. And there's the answer, 3 29 All right, we'll come back to this other problem if we, um, if we have time. But there's just so many different contexts that, that we can use that, you know, this is another one. Now, just to give you a hint about this one here, it's coconut followed by solid. So this one, you might want to do um, coconut, caramel, solid, something like that. And then for every branching, you're going to have three different options. So this one is a little bit more complicated. Coconut, caramel, solid. Coconut, caramel, solid. Coconut, caramel, and solid. So there are nine possible, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine eventual choice or nine choices that you can make. And the one we're after here is a coconut filled chocolate followed by a solid chocolate. So do you see the branch we're after? Coconut first, followed by a solid. Coconut followed by a solid. So we need this branch right here. And we would calculate the probability of a coconut and a solid in that order. Well, let's see if we can do it. I'm not asking you now to give me every probability. I just want you to give me the two that, that are the ones you have to use for this problem. So let's go back and think about it. We have that, we start off again with that fresh box of 30 um, chocolates. What's the probability right here? The very first selection of getting a coconut, right? So in the box, there are five. So we, we just need to choose one of those, five out of the total 30. All right, now the next one. Now the next one is we're gonna choose a, a solid. So we're here. But remember when we took that first coconut chocolate out of the box and ate it, there are now only 29 left. Since the first one we took out was a coconut, we didn't, eat any of the solids. So the same number of solids that appeared at the beginning in the box are still there. All chocolates are left, but okay. What probability goes on here? All right, good. 15 solids still remain, but now since one of those coconuts has been eaten, we're only selecting from 29. All right, so we don't even have to fill out the entire tree diagram. We just fill out the ones that we have to fill out to get our answer. And so we're going to take the 530 and multiply by 15 over 29. And this is equal to 5 over 58 as a reduced fraction. So just uh, a little bit less than 10% chance that that would happen. All right, chocolates, juices. You know, to me, they're all the same. To you, they might seem like different problems, but I see this one as very, very similar to the one we just did. It's just the context is different. Uh, a nice chest contains six of apple, apple juice, eight of grape juice, four of orange juice, and two of mango juice. All right. One number we always have to calculate is the total number in the, you know, we assume that they're all cans, they all feel the same way, so we can't reach in there and feel around and see if we can have one. But uh, so 10 and all right, so there's 20 total. You add those together. 20 total. And then it asks the probability of selecting. Oh, so now we're gonna select three cans, three. So it's not just two chocolate selections, it's three cans. And yeah, so here it says you're gonna select three cans instead of two. So your branching on your tree diagram is gonna go the first one, and then the second one, and then the third one. 
So you're going to multiply three probabilities along a branching there. All right, let me give you the, the whole tree diagram and uh, then we'll chart the path. And all right, so I'm going to call apple A, just to abbreviate, grape is G, orange is O, and mango is, is M. It will help me abbreviate the, um, the tree diagram. All right, so we've got the first and the second and the third selection. And, you know, in this context, it doesn't make sense just to select a can, look at it, record its value, and then throw it back in the chest, pick another one. Right, the, 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 the goal is you have two thirsty friends or three thirsty friends sitting in the other room and you, you wouldn't go back to them and say, hey, I ended up with one, I put the first two away. Um, no, you wanna take three cans to them, right? So it's the context. So you're not gonna select, you're not gonna put the same one in and select it. So this again is with, as we say, without replacement. All right, we have four different possibilities. So I'm gonna make a branch of four, apple, grape, orange, and mango. The second one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. You can see how these get very unruly very quickly. Apple, grape, orange, mango. Apple, grape, orange, mango. Apple, grape, orange, mango, and so on. All right. I'm not going to have uh, enough room maybe to write because you've got 16 outcomes here. And if I put four branches off each one of those 16, I'd have 64 different branches. And that's going to be very, very tedious. So instead of drawing that next one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, and so on, it just gets too tiny as you can see. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to look at three cans of grape. So that would be, what is the probability of grape, grape, grape? So the branch that I would have to figure out for that first one is right here. Grape and grape and grape. So I need the probabilities that go on each of these branches. Let's see if we can do it. The first can, now yeah, let's see it there. Okay, when we select the first can, we're selecting in that ice chest and there are 20 drinks in there and um, eight of them are grape. So grape and grape and grape, and we'd still have some grape left. All right, on our first selection then, what's the probability of getting a grape? Okay, good, somebody even re reduces it. Eight total grape out of the 20 we're selecting. All right, if you want, you can do this other you know, grid, and you could say, okay, now we have seven grape and 19 total, but everything else is the same. All right, now, when we go to select the second grape, given that the first one grape has left the chest, so we no longer have 20 cans, we have or juices, we have, we have only 19 now, and we no longer have eight grapes, we, we only have seven because we selected a grape on the first one. So what is the probability that I would put on this branch right here? Very good. All right, let's see if you can think about this further. Now, if we're going along this branch, then it means that the first two drinks that we selected were grape. And that means that we now only have six grape. And we only have 18 total. We selected two out of the 20, and they're no longer in the chest. We now only have 18 in the chest. Okay, so what's the probability of getting grape on the third? Okay, so it looks like you're picking up uh, how to do this. Now, then to, to, to calculate the probability of G, 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 instead of just multiplying the two fractions along the path, we're going to multiply, since it's three different drinks we're selecting, we're going to multiply all three. And there it is. Then you just have to simplify it. Let's see if we can simplify it. Yep, not easy, but 8 divided by 20 times 7 divided by 19 times 6 divided by 18. Math, convert to a fraction. Okay, so this would be 14 out of 285. The calculator will always reduce the fraction when it converts to a fraction. It'll reduce it to lowest terms. All right, why don't you do the next one?
All right, and then we'll go on with this. Uh, the next one says, what's the probability of getting a can of apple juice, then, oops, then a can of grape juice, and then a can of orange juice, in that order, A, then G, then O. Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds, go ahead. Here it is, A, then G, then O. A, then G, then O. Okay, oh good, there's lots of answers of eight over two, 285. So let's take a look. Um, let me just caught up with, get caught up with you here. Since there are six apple to begin with, that's six out of 20. But and if we're coming up here, that means one of the apples reduces to five, but everything else stays the same. And then so as we go down here and we're looking at G, there are eight G's out of the 19, but since we've gone up this branch, it assumes that we've selected one of these grapes. So in the next round, there's only seven to choose from. Still five apples, still four orange, still two mango, and those add up to 18. And then finally, the O branch here, we have in our third selection, we have four orange juices out of the 18. And so the probability of A, and G and O in that order would be 6 20ths. I uh, can't get it all on there, I don't think. 6 20ths times 8 19 times 4 18 And I'm, I'm sure that that, that that gives you 285. Because that's what everybody got. Okay, and there it is. Very good. All right, I'm not going to do problem number 30, but guess what? It's a, kind of the same thing. To me, it's just the same exact problem. It's just the context is not candies, chocolates, or juices in a chest, but it's rather you got a bunch of different uh, golf balls in a bag, and they're of different kinds. Um, they call it uh, experienced golf balls, the ones that I hit. They usually end up in the woods or the water. Experienced. Someone finds them, they go digging for them in the pond, they sell them in big bags. Okay, suppose the bag contains 20 Titleists and eight Max Flies and seven Top Flights. And so we have 35 experience balls total. All right, so this one, um, you know, you're selecting two, so you don't have a big tree uh, diagram, but uh, it's very similar to the others. So I'm gonna skip this one. And I wanna do one um, where we're using it. Um, our book calls it uh, exper uh, experiential. Experimental, experimental data. Uh, we, what we call it in statistics is empirical data. Data um, calculating probabilities based on data that was collected, empirical. Okay, so this was actual data in Florida, car crashes, and did the driver wear a seat belt? And then what was the result of the crash? Did somebody die? Did the driver die or did the driver survive? Did they wear a seatbelt or did they not wear a seatbelt? One of the things that you see is that most of the time, the driver survived. There were only uh, 2,111 accidents in Florida over this year uh, where people died. And notice that um, most of the time, if you compare these two numbers, most of the time people wore their seatbelts compared to not wearing their seatbelts in a crash. All right, so crashes happen, and then they record two things. Did the driver die, or did the driver survive? That's one thing they recorded. And the other thing they recorded was, you know, did the, did the driver wear a seat belt or not? Okay, so you can see that even in cases where the driver didn't wear a seat belt, most of the time the driver will survive. All right, so before you even enter a problem like this, it's good to just think about the data and what it means. Because if you don't know what the data means, if it's just a bunch of numbers, then you're not going to be able to make sense of the probabilities that they're asking you to calculate. So think about the, the, the context, think about what's being asked, and then we'll go in and calculate these. Okay, find the probability of not surviving a car accident given. So whenever you see given, that means conditional probability. And it's going to be that uh, little vertical line that we see, the probability of E given F. Given that the driver did
did not wear a seatbelt. Okay. <clears throat> and if I were to write it in symbols, it would look something like this. What's the probability of um, not surviving? I guess I would say driver died, given, given that the driver did not wear a seatbelt. Now I have a, we have a formula, the conditional probability formula. Oh, there it is, up here. The probability of B given A. It's the number in B intersect A divided by the number in A. So if we apply that here, we need the number of B intersect A. Here's B, here's A, intersection of those two. How many individuals from Florida in these crashes was it the case that the driver didn't wear a seatbelt and the driver died? How many? Driver died, no seatbelt. There it is, 1601. So there were 1,601 different accidents where the driver um, died and was not wearing a seatbelt. Okay, and then we divide by that, that by the number in A. Well, the number in A is the event that comes after the given. So what comes after the given is no seatbelt. So how many in this group of 577,000 crashes, car crashes, did we have someone not wear, did, do we have a situation where the driver was not wearing a seatbelt? What is that bottom number there? The number not wearing a seatbelt, no? Okay, yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, it's this number here, 128. Now, so that's it for this one. Um, you probably want to, you know, come up with a, a decimal number for that. So I'm not gonna worry about converting this one to a, a reduced fraction, but I'm just gonna take 1601 and divide by 164, 128. And you get 0 0.00975. So it's about 0.975%, right? Less than 1%. Is what that would mean. So it's unlikely that you're going to die even if you don't wear a seatbelt. There's only a 1% chance of dying if you don't wear a seatbelt and you get in a crash. This is the so, same idea that we're dealing with in COVID, right? I mean, the likelihood that you're affected is 0. 0.0004. Yet, if you get it and you don't know it, you can pass it around to someone who will have a, a higher chance of dying from it. So we change our behaviors and require laws that require you to wear your seatbelt, even if it's unlikely that you would die from a car crash if you didn't wear one. All right, let's do number 60. These are slightly different. Uh, for me, it's helpful to write the, um, you know, the probability that we're, we're trying to cal calculate here. Find the probability of not wearing a seat belt. And then uh, there's the given again, given that the driver did not survive. So the probability of no seat belt given that the driver did not survive the car accident. The driver died. All right, so do you see what they're doing here? They're just flipping the order. Driver died, driver died. No seat belt, no seat belt. So they're flipping the given piece. Now, given that the driver died, what percentage of those that ended up in a death where it was the driver not doing a seat belt? All right, so for this one, we have to look at those that meet both of these criteria, B and A, how many have no seat belt and driver died? Well, it's the same number, same question I asked you last time. It's that 1601. But in this case, the denominator uh, changes because now the denominator that we're gonna use is this one here, driver died. And how many did the driver die? Two, one, one, one. And that decimal is 0.758. So what this means is that um, if we knew, if, if we knew that somebody died or the driver died in an accident, we would be 75% sure that that person wasn't wearing a seatbelt. 
That's what it means. So you can see how different these probabilities would be if you just switch the two events. All right, so, so I wanted to give you mostly applications today and encourage you to set them up using a tree diagram. And uh, you can also calculate these using a formula and some empirical data. And the last thing that might help you understand conditional probabilities is Venn diagrams. So here are a couple of examples. This one here is about, you know, cat and dog ownership. Okay, um, so let's look at this. They put percentages, but remember percentages are very similar to um, decimals and probabilities. So you just as easily could use decimals here, probability values, instead of percentages. And you can use raw numbers if you knew how many were in your sample. If there were um, a thousand in the group total, then you could put 350, 100, 150, and 400. So it really doesn't matter the, the form of the numbers inside the Venn diagrams when you're calculating probabilities. It's just that they all have to be the same unit, either they're raw numbers, their percentages, or their probabilities. Okay, so I would be counted as one of these, these 100 here, these 10%, because we both have a dog and we actually have two cats. So we have both. So we're going to be in this group here. Uh, has a dog, has a cat, has both. These 150, uh, these folks, or these 15%, they have a cat, but they don't have a dog. They're not in the dog circle. And these 35%, they're in the dog circle, but they're not in the cat circle. So these folks here, uh, they own a dog, but not a cat. And what can you tell me about these people? Yeah, they, they own, they're not in either cat or dog circle, so maybe they own goldfish or a parrot or something. But they don't own a dog and a cat. If you can put percentages in here like this, then you can calculate conditional probabilities. So I'm going to write down our formula again from this uh, other page, and we will see if we need to use it or not. Here's the formula. Uh, the probability of B given A is equal to, now you can either use the number in B in this intersect A, or you can use the probability of B intersect A, but just be consistent as to which one you use. All right, let's, um, I mean, if you're gonna use the formula, then you probably have to translate the probability in words, what they're asking for here, into symbols, because if it's in symbols, then you can apply the formula here. But uh, basically they're saying, consider those folks that own a cat. If we use the purple numbers, how many own a cat? as a cat. Yeah, so those folks have a cat? Good. And those folks have a cat. So 250. So it looks like you have a preference for the numbers. So of the 250, all those folks that own cats, what is the probability that the person also owns a dog? So we're going to get rid of everything except the cat circle. Which of those 250 also own a dog? A hundred. Those hundreds. They own both a cat and a dog. So you just take a hundred and divide by 250. And you get 0. 0.4. Four tenths, two fifths, 40 percent. So I'm not alone. A lot of people own both. Well, 10 percent own dog and cat. But if we know they own a cat, then they have a disposition to like animals. And if they like animals, then and they own a cat, then chances are, well, not chances are, there's a 40% chance that they're not a one, pen, one kind of pet exclusive person. They might like multiple pets. And you can see it's 40% here. But if you write it down into the probability of given that they own a cat, what's the probability that they own a dog? And so we would have the number in cat and dog divided by the number in cat. And the number of cat and dog is the 100. The number of cat, 250. It works out. So we can actually solve these without the formula, but the formula also applies. All right, it says give your answer as a decimal without any percentage signs, round to two decimals. Okay, so if we follow their directions, we have to write that. If we interpreted it, however, we would say 40% of the cat owners 
also own a dog. Okay, this one does have the numbers already. Um, in this one, if you added them all up, you'd get 200, 150, 160, 200. And so 40 out of 100 would be 0 0.2, 0 0.20 or 20%, 0 0.05 or 5%, 0 0.25, 25 or 25%. And 0 0.50 or 50 percent. So again, I'm just writing the other numbers just so you know that it really doesn't matter how it's given to you. If you prefer working with decimals, you can do that. Okay, here's the given piece. Given that the student takes algebra. So the given part always comes after the vertical line in the probability statement. What is the probability that the student does not take chemistry? All right, so we can have number that take algebra and do not take chemistry. So you've got the and, that's the, the intersection piece of our, of our formula here. All of that divided by the number that take algebra. Let's work on the uh, easier number first. What's the bottom number of this fraction? The number that take algebra, okay? 50, here's the algebra circle. Actually, maybe I'll do this in three different ways. If I do it with decimals, I have 0.25. And if I do it with percents, I have 25%. So just using the different, uh, the different versions. And you'll see that in every single case, it'll come out to the same probability. Okay, top number. Which of the individuals in here do two things? They take algebra, but they don't take chemistry. How many individuals are we talking about here? They take algebra, but they don't take chemistry. Okay, good. These 10 here, are in both circles. So they take algebra and they take chemistry. These folks over here take chemistry because they're inside the chemistry circle, but they don't take algebra because they're outside the algebra circle. These 100 over here, they, don't take, they take other courses, but they don't take algebra and chemistry because they're not in either one of those circles. And this is the one we want. These are the folks that take algebra because they're inside the algebra circle, but they don't take chemistry because they're outside the chemistry circle. So 40, or if you use the decimal, 0 0.20, or if you use the percentage, and in every single one of these cases, we get 0.8. So uh, don't be alarmed if, if they give you kind of the whole numbers versus the percentages versus the probabilities. You're going to handle them in the same way. A lot of times we use the tool that gets us to the simplest um, answer, but and this, and this uh, Venn diagrams are, are nice, tree diagrams are nice, and the formulas are nice. So as you're doing problems, if you just have tried and tried and tried using one approach and it's just not working for you, uh, let's say you're trying to use a formula, if that doesn't work, then try a tree diagram. If that doesn't work, try a Venn diagram. And what's best is that you um, know how to go back and forth between all of those representations. I have a question here. How does the 100 not apply because those other 100 are taking chemistry? Yeah, so um, the way that this one is written, it's kind of like given that the student takes algebra. So because it starts off given the student takes algebra, we're immediately going to ignore those 100 because those 100s are not even taking algebra. Oh, David answered. So when it says given that the student takes algebra, we're only considering those inside the algebra circle, those 50 there. I will agree that these hundred do not take out uh, chemistry either, but they don't take, and this one says given that they do take algebra, and that's why we have to exclude them.